Uh, to pinpoint the exact time would be tough. I do know it was at the Goodwill Games. It was, uh, I, I believe it's still going the Goodwill Games, but it was the first time for hockey. So it was the middle of the summer. Guys were coming and going on that national team like crazy. But that would have been the, the, the first time I, I, I actually met him. I, I fancied myself a little bit of a research guy. So I you know, found out who was going to be at the tournament, who was going to be on the team, who was trying out at the summer camp, stuff like that. So I had a pretty good idea of, of who Joey was and what he'd done, especially at RPI. And um, just meeting him, I, it, it, he was an, an intriguing guy based on not only on the ice, but off the ice, the, the intelligence that he had and how well-spoken he was even at a young age. I think he was probably 22, not that that's young, but I mean, you know, for a hockey player at 22 years old to be, to be as, as well-spoken as, as he was and to read a little bit of, of his background even at that point to see what he'd done and where he'd been. And he was just a, a really, really intriguing guy and also a very humble guy. For what he'd accomplished already at that point, he just came across as a, just a genuine guy. And on paper, I think if anybody looked at it going into that tournament, we were probably, you know, ranked 6th or 7th or 8th by the media. But I think what we had going for us was we took sort of a, an odd group of guys. We had guys coming back from the NHL, Dave, Tan, uh, Dave Hannon, Tippett. Uh, Sean Burke had been in the NHL. We had guys that had played in the minor leagues for three, four, five seasons that were kind of maybe almost realizing that their dream of the NHL wasn't going to come to fruition. We had college guys like Joey. We had guys coming from junior. We had Eric Lindros, who was at a little bit of an impasse with the, the team in Quebec, and so he joined the team. And it was, it was rare, I think, in sports where you can get a group like that to just gel the way we did. I, I wouldn't say at that point that everybody was best friends. I mean, we all got along, but we, I think we all respected what each guy was doing and what they were going to bring to the table. And we knew that on any given night, everybody was going to give their all for each other. And I think that really created a bond that till this day, I don't even know if now, until we had this reunion a couple of summers ago, that we even realized it, you know, in our heads, but it was happening right in front of us. And I, t I think we just took it and ran with it because we did some incredible things there that really, like I said, on paper, maybe weren't supposed to happen. I, I don't think there was too much reaction because I think at that point, a lot of those guys had been around hockey. And, and again, we're, I mean, the hockey news, guys are guys are checking stats. Like hockey guys are are a weird crew. I mean, my wife still, still bugs me that I, I can't remember what I'm supposed to do tomorrow around the house, but I can tell her that in 1992, you know, Mario Lemieux had 63 goals and 29 assists or whatever it was, you know, and I think we knew of Joey and we were just looking for guys to come in that were going to be part of this, this unit and help lead us, you know, to the Olympics and be part of it. And I don't think there was any, any talk of where you came from, why you came, how you got there. It was like, you're here. And I mean, especially with a guy like Joey, I mean, he steps onto the ice in the first practice and you can see he's going to be a major, major effect on, on our team as far as his talent and just the type of guy he is. So I think every guy that ended up on that team just slid right into their role and, and everybody just, you know, welcomed everybody. Yeah, he was uh, a tremendous talent. Like he, uh, and I had the luxury of playing on his, on his wing, which once you figured out, it didn't take too long to figure out how you, how you needed to play with Joey. Like he didn't, he didn't demand that you give him the puck, but if you had any common sense at all, you knew to get the puck to Joey because all you had to do was give it to him, get yourself open, and chances are the puck was going to be back on your stick for an opportunity. If you got yourself open and the puck didn't arrive, chances are it was already in the other team's net. So it was a win-win situation. He was, he was a little bit ahead, I think, of, of, offense, of, of offense even at that point. Like he, he always knew where guys were, both opposition, both teammates, um, where to go, why to go there. Sometimes I'd watch and I'd think, I have no idea why this guy is going over there during this during the play. Sure enough, puck ends up on Joey's stick because he knew it was going to go from here to here to there. And if I stand here, I'm getting the puck. And as long as you skated around on the ice with your stick down, he was going to find you. And you had to have your stick down because it was coming at any time. It was coming through legs, over sticks, over bodies, whatever it was. And he was, he was a, just a tremendous talent. And I don't know what, whether the hockey world knew about him before that, like you said, but they certainly knew about him after that. And I think that's where also with Dave King, like I, I talk about Joey being smart and kind of ahead of times. Dave, Dave King, to me, he can see things in players that maybe others don't, or maybe he sees it sooner than, than somebody else does, and he knows what his team needs. Um, there's guys that, that played on that Olympic team that probably on paper people were looking and saying, but we don't understand this guy or this guy or this guy. But Dave had a reason for everything. And I think 
he saw Joey's natural ability and, and his, his ability to almost make things happen out of nothing, which you need in a hockey game. I mean, you're playing a 0-0 game against, you know, the Czech Republic or whoever it is, and all of a sudden you need a guy who he can just, you know, bust the game open with one simple play. And I think that's what Joey did for our team, and he did it, like, numerous, numerous, numerous times. And I think Dave probably – Dave doesn't just – you know, find you. He does a lot of research. I'm sure he watched Joey play a ton of hockey before he came to our team. And I mean, the, the proof is in the pudding, if you want to call it that. <laughs> He's quiet, but but he he leads in the way where he when he talks, people are going to listen. Uh, not only on the his play on the ice, but even just in the dressing room. Like he. He's a real student of the game and he's a bright, bright guy. So he's not in the room yelling and screaming, but all of a sudden something needs to be said and he says it and guys are going to take notice of it because he's, he's just a genuinely humble guy who really wanted the best for everybody. So when he did say something, you thought, you know what, that, that makes perfect sense because he's not just saying it for the benefit of Joe Juno, he's saying it for the benefit of our, of our team and this needs to change or this needs to be done. And he was, uh, he's, and he's a really humble guy. Like he's, he's gone on to great, great successes. We've hooked up the last couple of summers, and there, from him, there's no mention of I did this, I did this, I did that. I've gone here, I've done that. He's just a guy from Quebec, and I think that's the way it should be. He never ever demanded that the puck came to him, but I think as a player, you soon recognize what your line mates are all about and who needs to have the puck in certain situations for, th for things to work. And I think we were all team players. We, we didn't care that we, we passed the puck to Joey 106 times during the game. We realized Joey needs to have the puck. Eric Lindros needed to have the puck. Our, uh, a guy, Chris Lindbergh, who was our leading goal scorer, he didn't necessarily need to have the puck. He needed to have it at that second in front of the net to score the goal. You know, but a guy like Joey, he, he could kind of command and control the game by having the puck on his stick. And you just needed to figure out places where to go and why to be there and when to be there. And he was going to get it back to you. He was the, the least selfish player there was, although he needed to have the puck, if that makes any kind of sense. You know, I remember them all, but it was such a, such a blur because, I mean, we're there. Some of us had been with that program for four years, three years. Myself, I was there for two years, and now we were finally in that moment. And it's almost like it, you remember it all, but it's just a blur of trying to make sure that you're winning that, that next shift. Like we, we really, we just stuck to this shift, this shift, this shift, this shift. And at the end of the game, we were more times than not successful. But I don't know if there was, I think the, the, the obviously the German game where we went to a shootout to advance to the medal round was the, was the turning point of everything. I mean, if we lose that game, and I don't know if you've ever seen the video, but it's literally the puck. It's Leon Dreisaitl's dad from the Edmonton Oilers who takes the shot. And Berkey has it. He thinks he has it in his body. We think he has it in his body because our bench is at the far end. And after seeing the videos, I mean, the puck drops and it literally rolls. And I have no idea. Maybe it was Canadian luck or the hockey god said we really like Canadians. But that thing just turned on a dime and just stopped on the... And that kind of propelled us through where we'd had a tough struggle against the team again who on paper, the Germans probably shouldn't have, have been in that situation even. So I think it made us realize, like, this is real. Any team can beat anybody, including us. If we can get ourselves on a little bit of a roll here, we can go... I mean, the sky's the limit. I think Dave King is, is a genius. And he was able to put guys in situations that he knew they could handle... Throughout the, the course of the year or two years or three years or four years, I think he found spots for guys. And I think he challenged guys in, in to play in roles that maybe they weren't necessarily accustomed to coming from their teams. And, the, and it really paid dividends. I mean, you had guys who probably didn't block a shot in, in 10 years, now diving to block shots. You wanted to play for him, whether you agreed with some of the things that he wanted done or not, you, you wanted to to do it for him. He was uh, a guy that just, he, he treated everybody well. He let you know when you played well. He let you know when you didn't play well. There was no secrets with Dave. At the end of the game, if I phoned home to talk to my wife, I knew what the answer was. I played, you know what, I played really well, or I didn't play that good. And there was no gray, gray area, but it was always done with, you know what, this, this didn't work and here's how you can fix it. And I've never seen a coach at any level of hockey, you can come off the bench and three guys can ask him what just happened, like I should have done this or that, and he knows the answer to it all. In the fast-paced game of hockey, he's seeing everything, 
And I think guys just knew that he's here to make us better. And in the end, it's all going to come together at some point. And whether it's going to be a gold medal or seventh place or fifth, we're going to be prepared. We never went into any game not knowing exactly what needed to be done and what the other team was going to do and how we were going to do it and how we were going to play. You know, I think there was some of us, I mean, you get to that point, like this is the biggest at that point for guys other than, you know, we had Sean Burke, Dave Hannon, Tippett, uh, Kurt Giles had been in the NHL, which is normally the most, you know, most Canadian kids are dreaming of getting to the NHL. But for a lot of us, this was like our pinnacle of, you know, and the Olympics is a huge, huge, huge deal. And you're sitting there and you're thinking like, this is, this is happening like in two, three days where, you know, we're moving through or advancing through the medal round. And this is actually happening. And I think there was not, not only Joey, but I mean, there was a couple of other guys, but Joey just seemed to have, he was just calm because I really think he believed in his, in his abilities. And I think he believed in us. So there was really no reason to, to get uptight. We were going to go out. We we're going to put it all on the line. We we're going to play as well as we can. If we win, we win. If we don't, we've done all we can. And he kind of exuded that for the whole team, just his, his confidence and his calmness. Every shift for that kid was a, was a highlight, really. Like he, he, that, and that was his sort of thing. You knew at any moment the game was just kind of going along. And, and you had confidence in the team as a whole because you knew there was guys that could just turn this thing right around in a, in a matter of seconds. Like you just had to, to make sure that things went well in all of these different areas because bang, Joey's going to make one pass or he's going to fake a guy down in the corner and sneak out in front of the net and score. And for players like that, you know, at, at that Olympic games, I mean, Timo Solani, you might be able to say, um, you're, you're just, you're, you're just waiting for it. It's not, is there a highlight? It's, which highlight do we want to discuss? Because they, they were so creative, so talented, and they could just do it. It seemed at, at, the, at the proper moment. Some guys can do, do things when it's seven, eight, nothing. The talented guys, and Joey is one of those guys who when the game was 1-1, one, one, all of a sudden he pulls something off and you're up 2-1 and you're like, wow, now let's just hold the fort. Let's wait for him to do it again. And then it's 3-1 and... It, it just, it, it gave everybody, and Joy wasn't the only one, but I mean, obviously this is a, a focus on Joy, but we had other players like that too, that you were just, you knew at some point it was coming and it was just going to be, how big of a wow was it going to be when it happened? <laughs> I mean, you look around your team, you know who sits where, like everybody's a valuable member of the team. Some are maybe considered, you know, a little more valuable because they can do different things that, you know, during the game and... Uh, when you asked me for a stick, I, I, I was just talking to Joey about it, how the first time I ever saw, they were called aluminum sticks back at that point. I don't even know what the name is for them now, but they were aluminum sticks and the, and the Easton rep was at the Olympics and some of us were grabbing sticks and we wanted to try them. And basically we're, we're told, you know, like, there's, you're not, you're not going to pick up a stick that you haven't used because everybody had their own pattern stick, but these were just, you know, sort of off the rack because they were trying to get into the market. You're not taking a stick into the first game against France that you've never used in your life. And I remember skating out and thinking, but Joey's skating around with his because Joey could have used a tree branch. You know, he could have used his own pattern, the Easton stick, uh, a stick he found in the parking lot on the way in. It wasn't really going to matter. So preferential might be the, the, the right word, but also with a guy like that, I mean, I think everybody in, involved on the team knew that it's not going to matter what he uses, so just go ahead and let him, if he's happy, let him go ahead and use it. I think the brains, um, and I think in Joey's case, passion, like you, you even sit down and just talk to him about hockey. He is so passionate about everything. And I think passionate guys like that, when they get involved in the game, learn all of the little tricks and, and, and their brain works like 100% in their favor. And again, he just knew, he just knew the game. And you know, somebody who has that natural ability to know to go and stand in a particular area when everybody else are around him is going, that, that doesn't make any sense. And bang, the puck's on Joey's stick. You know, just, so he's, he's in more situations with the puck than maybe somebody else who just doesn't comprehend. Because there's, there's great hockey players out there at, at every level of hockey, but that maybe their, I think the new term is hockey IQ. Maybe their hockey IQ just isn't, just isn't there to know exact and, and hockey can be one inch, one second, you know, you turn this way instead of turning that way. Joey just knew, he just knew how to play the game, whether that was from growing up and studying it or whether somebody up there said like, you've just got it, you know, and he had it. 
I, I think a lot of teams run off of the top players, not only just talent wise, but I mean, if you've got a guy that's one of your most talented or the most talented player skill wise, and he's willing to work hard and, and every day, you know, there's not a time during uh, the course of that year where I could say like, geez, Joey's game's off and, and no wonder he's not even hardly working. Like he, he perfected his craft. Like he wa that's another thing that would, would probably separate some of those guys. He wanted to be the best player on the ice bar none. And to do that, you had to work hard and you had to think the game and you had to perfect your craft and he did that. He came kind of through the back door if you wanted. I think Joey always believed in his skill and, and his work ethic and that he w was going to be able to go places. But, I, but sometimes when other people aren't opening those doors for you all the time, you're like, I, I'm, I'm gonna have to do this on my own and I'm gonna show you and here's what I got. And I think Joey did that, especially at the Olympics. I think he said to the hockey world, here I am, Here's what I've got, and chances are someone's going to take it. <laughs> and I mean, at that time he was with Boston, but you know, I think after that Olympics they were, we got to get this guy in here. And maybe they did or didn't have that thought, you know, a month before. But he, he made them. Having only spent a couple of games in the NHL, I never really got the full feeling of an NHL career, so I only really have the Olympics to base it on. But Talking to Joey at, when we've had these these reunions, it's, it's really brought a, a really good feeling to me because I thought some of these guys, they went to the Olympics, they did their thing, they went on to a 10, 12 year NHL career and they'd forgotten about the Olympics. And that's about as far from the truth with all these guys, especially Joey. Like he he says this is one of the, the, the 92 Olympics, one of his greatest hockey moments ever. And to put on the Canadian jersey, it, it's kind of cliche, and you'll see it in movies, or every guy's going to talk. It literally sends a chill up your spine every time you put it on, whether it's at the Olympics, whether it's at a game uh, halfway through the season in Vulcan, Alberta, when we're playing the Fins or whatever it is. It's a it's a feeling that you can't. I believe you can't explain to somebody who hasn't done it, and I don't mean that in a rude way that you know people should all be able to experience because I think that's part of the of the lure of it is you're, you're putting that jersey on and there's only 22 guys every four years at an Olympics that get to do it. It's, uh, it's an incredible, incredible experience. It was, uh, again, it was like, it was a blur. Like we went into that game, we were really, really confident. We believed at that point with some of the games we had played before that, that we could, we could beat this team because now it's a one game showdown. Maybe if we played the Russians, you know, a best of seven or best of nine or best of 20, maybe they, maybe they squeak it out. But we thought in a one-game showdown, anything is possible. Other teams proved that against us. We thought we played some really good teams. France, was we snuck out 3-2. Germany, we had to go to the shootout, you know. So we went into that thinking anything's possible. It was 0-0 uh, after two periods. So now we're 20 minutes away, and this is like... 20 minutes away from a dream come true and it uh there was a goal it went we watched the video in the summer when we had this little reunion like the puck goes off the backboards and it literally comes out on an angle that you couldn't make that puck come out in a million more years Berkey turned the one way because the angle the puck should have came that way I don't know if there was a little jut in the boards but, but it came right back out from the side it came and their guy tapped it in it was one nothing they made it two nothing Actually, they made it 3 nothing, and then we scored late. But, I mean, we were, we were in the game right till the end. But I'll tell you what, we were, we were upset. We, like, there, there was some tears. There was, after that game, it took a little, little while, but I think we realized after the fact, like, we laid it on the line. On that day, whether it was bad luck, whatever it was, a really, really, really good hockey team beat us. And everybody says, well, you, we, we say we lost the gold. I think after you take a look at it, like we want a silver medal. Like there's not too many silver medals out in the world, you know. And in my opinion, now we we won a silver medal. That's that's the way we look at it. The unfortunate part is at that point, the only anthem that's getting played is the Russian one. Or at that time, they were called the Unified Team. So I don't even remember what song it was. I I, I can tell you, I don't really remember the the after game. I mean, other than the the shock of losing and stuff like that, but. Anytime we play in, in Canada or at other tournaments and you win, you know, they play the anthem, it's, again, it's it, like, it's, it sends a, a chill up your spine. Like, you're, you're there and you're, you don't realize the, the impact you're having on your country. We got back and I'm talking to people and they're like, geez, 
I was at SaskTel working and me and three buddies took a TV into the storage room that was two feet by two feet and we stood in there for three hours shoulder to shoulder being really quiet so that our boss didn't catch us. And I'm thinking, you, you actually got up at whatever time or went to work and snuck to watch a hockey game. I've heard stories like that, you know, school kids being at school watching it. Uh, adults that come up to me that happen to recognize me around town and say, you know what, I can tell you exactly where I was during that final game. And to me, that's, I mean, that's incredible that people went to those lengths to support us. But we're Canadians. We love sports. We certainly love hockey. And people are proving it every day with stories that I hear about where they were in 92. And that's almost 26 years ago. I mean, we've, we've, we've talked about lots of different stories. I don't know if there's, and I don't know if he was part of it or not, but I know that some of our guys uh, took the dinner trays from, from the cafeteria at the Olympic Village and did a little bit of, I guess, tobogganing or sledding or whatever you were you, doing. Because we were in Mirabelle, which there was a mountain there. And in hindsight, I mean, we're 20 to 27, 28, 29 years old. We're, we're technically, we're, we're kids. We're in a pressure situation like this. This is either sit in your dorm room and, you know, worry about the next game or the next shift. And some guys, and, and, I, and I can't say that Joey was part of it for sure. We did talk about it in the summer, but did some tobogganing on the on the dinner trays, which in hindsight, I mean, one little slip up and all of a sudden Joey Juno's coming down the mountain with a broken arm, we're done. But you know what? There's got to be a time where you need to relax. That was the way some of the guys relaxed and it all worked out in the end anyway. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, he, like I said, he's just, he's, he's one of those rare breeds that's really, really, really good at lots of things. I mean, the guy, like, as far as his college marks and and where he could have went in the you know as, as far as not even playing hockey he would have been a, a success at anything but you would never know the guy has scored a goal at the olympics scored a goal in the nhl been an all-star you know any of that stuff he's just a normal guy who when we got together these past two summers there was no i i i it was he's he's more concerned about what i'm doing what my family's doing how we can find a way to get together again and not a whole lot of talk about his successes at all. And I think guys in sports appreciate that, that he's just in it and he happens to be good at it, but is going to treat everybody else with respect. And he, there's no errors about this guy at all, at all.